which will have as one of its features the legacy is the social injustice that our colleague was talking about. To answer that question, must, we must be able to answer the question, what is it that we have not done as a result of which we have not succeeded to eradicate that legacy? Because yeah. I'm saying within that legacy we will find the social injustice that is spoken of. We should in, would include this discriminatory thing in terms of the wages, salaries, earnings of the Banyana Banyana versus the Bafana Bafana. Manifestation of the same problem. I'm saying there's a larger question. Uh, the radical change of the society away from its past. Uh, It's only, I think, in that context that we'll be able to address the matter of social, social injustice, as it has been raised, within the context of the larger thing, and answer the question, why have we not succeeded? Yeah. What do we as students at the African school say? What does our, our, our leadership in the intelligentsia say? And what are the solutions? Yeah. The, the question that was raised about uh, inf infant infantization, infantilization, okay. Um, that there are people who talk down to us, uh, treat us like infants. It was not said who this person is who does that. Uh, or institution or whatever. Uh, I really would have appreciated an understanding of that. Uh, if, to, for, for one to lead, if one to lead people, you, you can't talk to them as infants. You've got to respect them. Even if you are asking for them to respect you, the mass of the people to respect you, you must also show respect for them. The, uh, the Vice Chancellor spoke about uh, the imbues of processes that we used to have when we were in government. Uh, I remember one imbues, uh, which was in the rural areas. It was on the border between Mpumalanga and Limpop. Real rural areas. Deep rural. And uh, so we got there, and I was told by the organizers that there was an old man who had traveled overnight to come to the Imbis. Old man. And then they said, That's it, that is he. So, uh, so they had arranged that among the people who would raise their hands. He, he should be allowed to ask a question or say whatever. And indeed, he raised his hand. And he said, uh, President, I'm not uh, standing up to ask for anything. I'm standing up to say thank you very much for what you've done for me. Uh, I have a pension, he said. It's a good pension for me which you increase every year. And thank you very much. And he says, you've also given me a house. So I live in this house, I'm, I'm quite happy. So as you can see, President, I'm not complaining. But President, you know where, uh, one of my problems is, uh, a, a main major problem is that uh, my wife passed away many years ago. Yeah. Now, this is my request. Please get me a new wife. <laughs> <laughs> so this old man, so we were, I couldn't promise. I said, I'll try and attend to the matter. <laughs> yeah. 
But what was interesting, really, and that's all the old man said. But why, the way it came across to me is that this old man had come to a conclusion that here is a government which respects me. So I will travel and I can talk to them on any issue that's of concern to me. Uh, so I'm saying that it's a notion of infantilization. You can't lead people if you communicate like that. Uh, it's when the people understand that I can communicate to these ones and they will treat me with respect, whatever I say. Um, so whoever is responsible for this, I think they need to take care of that, take notice of that, because it surely can't be a problem, a manner which we approach. If it's Professor Lengabula here, <coughs> who's treating the students like that, infantilizing them, <coughs> is wrong, it obviously is wrong. Uh, the administration of this university would have to treat the students with respect <coughs> and listen to the problems that they are raising and act on those problems. <coughs> the, uh, the African, uh, it, it was correct that the African Union took the decision uh, to have the uh, the Continental Free Trade Area <coughs> and to act to implement it. But again, as I was saying at the beginning, it's very important, I believe, to understand uh, objectively what we mean to achieve in, those, in that context. This is a Continental Free Trade Area with whatever decisions have been taken in terms of which goods should move freely without duties and all of that. <coughs> but central to the success of a continental free trade area, obviously, is the capacity to trade among ourselves. If all of us, half a dozen countries, produce pineapples, why are we exporting pineapples to one another? The question, therefore, of the development of the African economies, the development of new projects, manufacturing and all of that, becomes central to the matter of the success of the continental free trade area. So that we've got some things to trade among ourselves. Yeah. The, the SADC area here, a uh, long time ago, took various decisions which have got to do with its integration, with its own con uh, free trade area and all that. And part of the decision that was taken then, that first decision was, we should aim to reduce tariffs uh, over whatever period, uh, but that because the South African economy is so much stronger than the others, it must reduce tariffs first and faster than everybody else. Yeah. Which happened, and back, back to my pineapples. Yeah. So one of these African countries in the region, yeah, in terms of that, wanted to export pineapples to South Africa in terms of that free trade area. And South Africa said, no, 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 we can't. We can't receive this, we can't take this. Uh, because of, of health issues. That by the time you export this plant from this country to South Africa, you must have checked that it does not carry any plant diseases. Uh, and this particular candidate, they know have no such capacity to do all of that. So South Africa had to take a decision to say, in which case, we're going to work with you in order to build that capacity so that you have something to export. Otherwise, this free trade area doesn't mean anything. 
So what I'm trying to say, colleagues, is uh, the question that was raised was when we, would, we, would we have an African currency? Sure, it, it may come at some point. But I think it becomes important to understand when, when you have transnational currencies like that, like the euro, like the euro in Europe, what is it that had to be done first in order to, to make it possible to have a currency like that? Uh, the same challenge would face us on the continent here. Yeah. Uh, the common currency, uh, that means you then also have agreed on a common monetary policy. That is, Africans who will then have a common monetary policy because we've got a single currency. Yeah. That has to develop, that has got to come with time. So the question is not, uh, will we have a currency? Sure, we'll have. But the question is, how, what is it that needs to be done to get to the stage where in that we can then introduce that currency? And that's part, that's part of what uh, our intelligence has got to deal with to be able to say you may wish for things uh, aspiration it's a good aspiration but in the end you got to say concretely what is it that needs to be practically so that we reach this aspiration the south africans among us we will know that for instance for some years now We've had uh, uh, the NDP, the National Development Plan. Very, very comprehensive. Deals with every major thing, whether it's economic or education or health or roads or whatever. And very accepted by the population as a well. whole. It's called the National Development Plan. The challenge is that it's not a plan. It's a vision. Yeah. This is where we would like to be by the year 2030. This is our vision. But this other question, which bus must you catch in order to get there by 2030? That question has not been asked. So you remain with this lovely vision, and we complain to this day that nothing has been done in order to implement the National Development Plan. Nothing has been done because there's never been a plan. Yeah. So uh, again, I'm coming back to this point. So when we say we want a common African currency, um, we want a, a chancellor of university who must speak loudly about university matters. Uh, it's got to be based on an understanding of the reality we are dealing with. And back to the matter, therefore, of the quality of the intelligentsia that must come out of this school. Uh, The, uh, I think it's said enough about the energy crisis. It's clear that, again, with regard to that, we have to look again at the question of, of the leadership of ESCOM. I think Padili Hotla was right. But I think we need to go back a bit with regard to ESCOM in order to be able to understand these problems. For instance, we've got these two new power stations, Midupi and Kusili. When it was decided we need, we need new generation capacity, it was correct. The leadership of ESCOM at the time decided uh, not, not to have 
what is called a turnkey project. Now, a turnkey project is uh, the University of South Africa says it requires a room as big as this, uh, which must be able to sit a thousand people, and they want it ready in three years' time, uh, and they are prepared to pay so much. And then you put out the tender, and Tabun Peggy Incorporated Company, they win the tender. All of the university wants is that this company must produce this hall in three years' time according to the specifications. <clears throat> now, who, who, my company, to whom it subcontracts, no, you must uh, do the rails and you must do whatever. That's the business of the company. University wants a hall like this, according to specifications, in three years' time. <clears throat> the leadership of ESCOM did not do that. To put these 10 key projects. But it broke up the contracts into pieces. So that the contract from Itopi, instead of being one tender that goes up, you put out 20, 30 tenders for elements of this one contract. There will be a, a tender for welding. When all these parts have come together, then there must be a welder. These two power stations, Kusil and Mitrupi, they generate electricity at higher temperatures than the old coal-fired power stations. But for some reason, as the tender is won by Tower Begin Corporation to, to do the welding, they don't tell my company that these two power stations generate electricity at higher temperatures. So I do my welding according to my knowledge of welding for coal power fire stations. <clears throat> so one unit is ready, and you kick it on. Now let's, we're ready now to, so we try that. And the welding melts. So you've got to stop this thing and start again. So the cost goes up, and the time to complete goes up, So that's what I'm saying, and you know, I'm talking about the practical thing. Uh, when you say that uh, some of these power stations started being built in 2007. Thank you. 2007. This is now 2022. Why does it take so many years? This is part of the problem. ESCOM did not have the capacity to manage a broken up contract like that. So I'm saying with, in order to dealing with this electricity, it's sure is to keep the lights on now. But I think to understand the company better, you need to go further back. Yeah. Who took decisions like that? One explanation I've seen uh, for that, it is said that uh, the, the, the managers were in charge of this, they said they want to increase the possibilities for black economic empowerment. So that if you now have 20 contracts, that means 20 black companies. If you had one contract, I suppose it means one black company. That's the explanation that was given. But that's part of the crisis. As you can see now, <clears throat> when the ESCOM announces that, uh, you know, the reason we're having level four, level five, or whatever, is because there's a power failure at Nidupi, at Kusile, and the old ones. Why are the new ones behaving in the same way as the old ones? Or misbehaving in the same way? 
I think we need to understand all of that in order to, as part of the contribution to the solution of the problem of, of ESCO. And I'm, I'm sure we are not going to become an oligarchy. Uh, capitalist oligarchy or something like that. Uh, politically, no. Uh, I think the, the, the population in this country understands very well uh, the notion of the people shall govern. And in the end, I can, you see what is happening, for instance, with the ANC. <laughs> if you look at the election record, The ANC increases its people vote for it from 1999 to 2004. Then from 2009, it goes down, and it's been going down ever since. Uh, in the national and provincial elections, in the local government elections, continuous downward flow since 2009. So I'm saying the population is, is dissatisfied, obviously, with the ANC. That's why four numbers vote each, 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 each year, each, each election. That population is therefore, I don't think it's going to allow for the emergence of an oligarchy, oligarchy uh, which undermines the democratic system, the capacity of the people to make part of, to contribute, to take decisions about the kind of South Africa they want by virtue of the votes that they cast and so on. So I don't think there is, there will be image in an oligarchy like that. Whatever the capitalists think, I don't know what the capitalists are thinking, uh, but certainly uh, I, I do not believe that there's going to be an oligarchy. oligarchy. And the, the big challenge everybody, as everybody knows, many people are discussing this question about uh, how do you manage coalition governments. It's arising out of the practical experience uh, that rather than go oligarchic, uh, the country is becoming more democratic. I don't know how many hundreds of political parties contested the, the local government elections in November last year. So it means uh, uh, once I'm unable to speak, to talk like this, I can set up my own party. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Thank you, Chancellor. Very comprehensive responses. I'm going to allow around questions. I'm hoping colleagues are ready with the microphones. Um, yeah, yeah, there's a crisis. <laughs> the crisis. I see your hand. And I'm going to be very systematic. I think this side of the hall, just, just wait. Okay? I think to make it fair. Um, we'll just look at the side and quickly do a quick couple of questions. Yourself, yourself. You know, I've done this section, my brother. Uh, you, you were sleeping at that moment. Um, my brother with a the tie there. I know you are yourself. And uh, I'll, th I'll take those three questions. No, you, you are first. Yes, you are indeed first. She's in the, indeed first. Number two. Number three. So I'm going to do round robin, my friend. You'll be number four, and I'm going to take the lady in, in red. Uh, that will be five questions. Uh, please remember, name, say name, uh, not long, context of your question, in that order. You are first, you'll be number two. I think I noted number three with a tie up there, number four, my brother, and number five in red. Thank you, Sambanani. My name is Nobubonga Nazibugo. 
uh, far more than that, you're reflecting on your leadership um, uh, during your tenure. Is there anything that you feel you would have done better, especially with regards to HIV and AIDS policies? Thank you. Deb, good day, I'm Patrick Kayono. Um, my question is somewhat related. Um, when negotiations were happening and determining what the country would look like, it was opted for a unitary state where the other groups were more interested in the federal states. And my, my question is why, um, what is the thinking behind that? So we've seen some countries like Ethiopia where the federal state has a bit more complicated and was the thinking that if various sub-national groups would form here, um, yeah, what is the thinking, thinking of not going, going towards more sub-national groups and having, and having one entry state instead? Thank you so much. My name is Yoloka Azimfuto. Uh, well, my question is on around young people. I want to ask that um, the former president spoke um, so much about good leadership, right? But amongst young people right now, we see that there's no reward for good leadership. I'm talking as a student in high institutions where we see that if you're a good leader, I'm meeting the leading organizations, you are not necessarily getting any reward to be in positions. However, if you're partisan and somehow very much aligned to your comrades, then you can get rewarded. So how do we motivate young people to partake in politics and ultimately be part of parliament and other institutions continentally outside being um, part of the um, political organization that are leading in the continent? Thank you. All right, thank you, thank you. Before, before um, the chancellor comes, there's a lady next to you, Alfred, on your, on your, right, on your left, sorry. The same row. And then Matuma, that gentleman will be the last two in this section. Thanks. Greetings, Mr. President. My name is Tobela. I just want to find out what is your view on the introduction of wealth tax in South Africa to bridge the inequalities that we are facing? Thank you. All right. Mr. President, I just want to ask you about these African leaders, all of them. They don't care about its citizens. 
African children as busy scavenging all over the world. And then while these leaders, they are doing well expensive sweets, preparing bed for their offspring, but they don't care about its citizens. Like now in South Africa, our health system is something else. Like recently, Obiwera Machuba, we spoke something else. And then it is in the reality that we are facing. And now South Africa, is it every time, whenever they say something, they say South Africa stars are okay. What they say, and then what I think, I mean, based on my opinion, it seems as ethnic they are, they are, they come from the uh, same room. They like doing their own thing. Why? And then we, we are suffering. We are suffering. Thank you. Okay. Um, well, I, I will come to, to, to this section. Um, because I want to finish this section. Um, not you, sir. Um, this part of the hall, is there any other hand? If not, we are moving on. They are happy. Oh, that gentleman next to you, uh, I would, and then we will be done with this section of the hall. Thanks. Peter Sandra, I'm going to hear, Chair. Uh, Mr. President, uh, did you, by any chance, enjoy your youth days? Uh, a follow-up question would be, what would you advise young people in Africa uh, to do or <clears throat> to do to make sure that uh, Africa becomes a better place? Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I think that's... No, wait, no, you're coming. Um, so we have been kind enough to go through questions quickly. We will come this time. We will have time. And Mr. President, I think it's uh, your chance to address us. These are seven questions. Uh, we are scheduled to adjourn at five, which is in an hour's time. And Serpo is saying there's another round of questions coming. Uh, so it's an instruction that we must be very brief in these answers. Uh, about the matter of the wealth tax, I mean, personally, I, I have no problem with it. If uh, uh, the necessary calculations are done, uh, how much work would have to be done in order to collect it, its implications, therefore, for how to administer that tax, uh, its larger social impact. I mean, if all of those things are done and it's indeed it's viewed, it's agreed that uh, there should be a wealth tax. I, in principle, I don't think there's any problem with it. But again, we come back to the question I keep raising, that it requires thinking uh, and proper calculation and so on. Then you take a decision like that. In, but in principle, of course, there's nothing wrong with it. Uh, with the wealth tax. Yeah. The role of the youth, motivation, motivation of the youth and all of that, those, those questions. I think the first thing that needs to happen, this will also relate to the matter that was raised about African women leaders. I think the, one of the first things we need to do is to organize the youth. To get the youth organized so that the youth can engage one another about themselves, about their own aspirations, about what they need to do in order to realize those aspirations. Yeah. Yeah. Two, three, four weeks ago, yeah. I was talking to the leadership, part of the leadership of the ANC Youth League. And I was saying to them, if you look at the uh, crime statistics, uh, 
you would find that in the age cohort, from 15 to 30, 35, that cohort, the single biggest cause of death is what is called unnatural causes. That means that young generation, the biggest cause of death among themselves is stab wounds, gunshots, car accidents, that kind of problem. Huge numbers of young people at that age are dying not because they are ill, but because of the so-called unnatural causes. It's very much part of the violence of the society. So I was saying to them, now you as the youth leaders, what are you doing about that? Because that matter has got to be very relevant to the agenda of a political youth formation. And that's exactly the, the cohort which is a member of the Youth League. I'm saying to them, the majority of people at your age, the biggest cause of death is unnatural causes. So shouldn't you as a youth movement say, look, we have to intervene in this society which is killing young people of our age. Of course, when we talk to them, they, in a sense, they get surprised. Because the matter never occurred to them. Yeah. That this has got to be part of their agenda. So in the end, I'm saying the role of the youth, motivation of the youth, the first thing I think, is for the youth to get organized. And the youth themselves to discuss what is it that we want of, of our country in future. And that what needs to be done today in order to get there. This matter was very easy to answer in our own youth. Yeah. Because you are faced with apartheid every day. At school, in the playing field, whatever mm -hmm. you did, you are confronted by the fact of this apartheid. Yeah. And so it was very natural for young people to say, therefore, we are part of the struggle to end this apartheid system. It's very, very easy to answer that question. But the challenge today, what, the, what, what, what does the youth, what do they want, the youth want? They want education, very correct. The youth must go to school and then in the U.S., it's very correct. They want jobs when they finish school, agreed, it's very correct. Yeah. But when we say fine, now with regard to the construction of the society that you would wish for, what are your suggestions? Then the question does not become that easy to answer. So with regard to I'm saying the role of the youth and uh, uh, motivating the youth, it really is to say, look, the this country belongs to you. Let's, let's do something now so that as you get older, the country you will inherit is the country of your dreams. Yeah. And what do we do? Yeah. I've said this thing, used this example before, that once we went to uh, Nelson Mandela University, And this matter arose about access to higher education, free higher education. Uh, so uh, I say, yes, I agree. But I'd like uh, some of you students to come with me in a delegation to the villages to say, these, our students must get free higher education. All of them. Government must pay. So it's free of charge. But that's got to mean that for this year, 
we will have not enough money in order to provide clean water to the village. So let's go, you and your students, let's go to the villages. To say, please postpone clean water so that I get higher education. Because it's not as though there's unlimited sums of money which can finance everything at the same time. Choices have to be made. Uh, what about this choice? I don't remember that there was any hand that stood up to say, okay, I'm ready to come with you. But I'm saying these are the challenges that, that you want to say, the youth. The youth in saying, this is where we want, we ourselves as individuals want to be, where we want the country to be. Answer this question. What are the steps that you've got to take to get there? Yeah. And then you try and you have to grapple with challenging issues. Yeah. Which is fine. I think that for the youth, for the youth to be creative, to think, and uh, they will probably have better answers to the question like I'm saying. How do we deal with this real problem? that the majority of the people that would be belong to this youth category, the single biggest cause of death is unnatural causes. What do we do about that? Yeah. We can't ignore it. It can't be as though it, it, it's not happening. Yeah. And I'm saying the youth may very well have better answers than I would have to say, let's deal with this question in a particular way. And maybe part of what explains it is what this tragedy which occurred in East London in the tavern. What were young people of that age doing in the tavern? Yeah. Maybe it says something about our society, that our society allows a thing like that to happen with those terrible consequences. Yeah. I'm trying to respond to the question about the role of the youth and youth motivation. And in the end, I think let's first of all organize the youth, make sure the youth is organized and is able to engage one another in order, in, in fact, to even to answer this question. What should our role, what we think our role should be as a youth? Um, I think that that would be important. Tsepo did say earlier, from what I remember, uh, that uh, on one occasion we talked about uh, a mainst gender mainstreaming. Uh, this question about women leaders. By and large, on the African continent, by and large, we inherit patriarchal societies. Historically, traditionally, peasant society, mostly in the world like that. Um, and we want to move away from those patriarchal societies. Exactly to create the space so that women can play an, an equal role with men without discrimination. We want to get there. But how do you get there? The gender mainstreaming concept and practice is very, I, I believe, very important. There was a study that was done in this country in terms of the universities, uh, the teaching staffs. Uh, and the basic conclusion was that within the professors and senior lecturers and all those people, there's continuing discrimination against women in terms of that system. And an example was given that, for instance, uh, you have a, a woman lecturer who's also a mother of a young child. So she comes to lecture here, but at a certain time, she's got to drive to go home to go and breastfeed this infant. So for so many hours, she's away from university. And that impacts on the prospect for her promotion. So, 
That's discrimination because the men don't breastfeed. So they are, they are at university for 20 hours. Yeah. But she has to leave. She can't be there for 20 hours continuously. So one of the U.S. universities said, in which case, why, why are we not then creating a situation whereby she does not have to leave university? Let it become the responsibility of the university to create a crash, to have baby minders, so that when uh, Professor so-and-so has got to go and breastfeed, she just walks down the passage. Then she does not lose so many hours, which counts against her in terms of promotions within the university. I'm saying that's an example of gender mainstreaming. When you say that uh, uh, raise this question, very legitimate question, about what is happening with regard to the matter of women leaders on the continent. The, the answer has to be that bearing in mind the reality that we inherit basically patriarchal societies, in order to defeat that patriarchy, you've got to engage in this gender mainstreaming. It's a conscious effort. Uh, so that we might very well find women who are because of this history, the men are very loud in the meetings. They know how to shout and to be seen and to be heard and, and all of that. And the woman is a bit shy, can't tell. But you, you want them to be outspoken, to be as vigorous as these men. But you've got to take particular measures in order to create a possibility where you build that confidence so that women can intervene as any other. That's why I'm saying that, uh, talking about this gender mainstreaming. It's got to be a conscious effort. Uh, women's leagues. Uh, the women's league, are, uh, women's political women's leagues are, are one of the institutions which should, should be mobilized for this purpose. See, it's a task of the Women's League to make sure that the matter about this discrimination against women is addressed. And this is what we need to do with regard to that. Yeah. Where you have a persistent problem of uh, uh, absence of African women leaders uh, on the continent, it's really essentially because, in a sense, you do, you, the progressive movement on the continent is weak. The matter about, the matter about emancipation of women and so on is a very political matter. Yeah. And where you have a progressive movement that is very weak, it will perpetuate the patriarchy. Uh, so it's a challenge that on the continent to say uh, what do we do about the matter like this to, to develop a movement that would engage this issue in a systematic manner. Uh, I think that's a particular challenge. We don't, we don't movement uh, Political movement on the continent is not strong enough. That's why they're not doing this uh, particular issue. The, the big question that is raised about uh, unitary versus federal states, uh, smaller national groups within, is, is correct. Because all African countries, all African countries, uh, and diverse countries, almost all of them. Uh, diverse in terms of uh, language groups, cultural groups, religious groups, and, and even color. Um, 
And indeed, the, the the correct approach, my view, is that uh, the, the, the notion of uh, unity in diversity is correct. For my, almost all our countries, South Africa and uh, let's have unity in diversity. As part of that expression of that here, that's why, for instance, it was decided that said, let's have so many official languages. It's to address that matter about unity and diversity. But again, we come back to this issue about the progressive movement. We have this terrible conflict in Ethiopia, has been going on since uh, uh, November 2020. I'm sure all of us have seen the report yesterday that uh, there's a, a report that Eritrea has now invaded Tigray, large forces, combined Eritrean forces and the National Army of Ethiopia. Uh, at the base of that conflict, which has claimed lots of lives, uh, in terms of that war that's been going on since the end of 2020, is this matter. You have a very a diverse Ethiopian population, uh, ethnically, uh, uh, whatever the, you, the, 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 the word that is used, uh, or are Oromos, Zamharas, uh, Tigrayans, and, and, and Somalis, and, and all that. How this is one Ethiopia. Originally, all of them got together, were put together like this as a, as a result of feudalism. It's called conquering by the emperors and the, but in the end, even when it becomes a democratic country, you inherit that reality. Yeah. A very high sense of consciousness in terms of identity. Yes, I'm Ethiopian, but I'm also Amharic. And so you'd get an argument which says, for instance, uh, when the uh, Tigrayan People's uh, Liberation Front and others removed uh, uh, an earlier government, uh, Mengistu, uh, introduced a new federal constitution. So Ethiopia became uh, a democratic, federal, ethnic state. And the allegation that is made now, uh, in the last two years, three years, has been that in that federal arrangement, the Tigrayans became the dominant force, though they are uh, relatively small in terms, but they became the dominant force. And that's part of the reason for the war that is going on now. So I'm saying that we have a challenge on the continent practically to address that matter of unity and diversity. Uh, in the context of which then you can decide what kind of political system do you have? A federal system, and when you say federal, what do you mean by federal? Uh, to define that federation, and, but at the same time you want to to keep the national cohesion, that we are, in, we are Ethiopian together. Though we will recognize the fact that uh, these identities at a lower level must be recognized and respected. At the same time, the national, common national identity must also be respected. I'm saying it's a challenge to construct societies to be able to deal with those sorts of issues. But it's a common problem, it's across the continent. Uh, it's here in South Africa. Uh, the other day we were talking about, I was saying publicly, if you look at the ANC, just look at the membership. Over time, the ANC, the membership of the ANC, they're more or less exclusively black African. Uh, but the fundamental policies of the ANC would be 
we were a, a multiracial, multi faith, multi color, multi whatever. Yeah. And so the ANC, an organization like the ANC, representing the people of South Africa, that's the people of South Africa. But it doesn't, in, the, in its membership, uh, maybe two white people, I don't know, uh, 10 colored people, 15 Indian, and you know, all of that. I'm saying it's this challenge of unity in diversity. Uh, how, do, how do you do it? How do you manage it? And again, I'd like to say that we come back to the question about the absence of progressive political organizations. Uh, and ANC fails to address this matter in terms of its own membership and wants to call itself progressive. How, in what way progressive? Uh, it's a fundamental matter, a critically important matter in this country, given the way the population is composed. Yeah. So yes, indeed, I, I think the point that was being made, that it's not always necessarily correct that you just have a unitary state, which does not recognize the fact of the diversity. I think the observation was, was, was correct. With regard to the migration question, uh, into into South Africa. Uh, I think that, I think colleagues, one of the things that we must recognize here is that uh, as as our people in the country engaged in the struggle uh, to liberate ourselves from apartheid, the rest of the continent engaged that struggle. Uh, got itself involved, support to the liberation movements, uh, support to students, we had lots of students, for instance, after 1976, who left and uh, absorbed into schools across the continent. Uh, and the African continent has felt for, me for, for a long time, very, very close to this country that it had its own responsibility to assist in the liberation of the people of South Africa. In, in, in the region here, yeah. uh, you take a country like Mozambique, just across our border, which lost thousands and thousands of people killed because it was refusing to walk away from support for the struggle here. The same thing happened in Angola. Uh, yeah, in the cross the border in Zimbabwe. You know, 1990, that year 1990, in terms of the constitution that had been negotiated for Zimbabwe, uh, the clause which was uh, no redistribution of the land for 10 years. Um, then 1990, the end of that period, 1990 then Zimbabwe can then change the constitution to address the land question as it wishes. And the leadership of Zimbabwe decided not to. It's a very conscious decision that it is now possible for us to change this constitution so that we can then grapple with this thing about land distribution in Zimbabwe. The reason the leadership decided not to in 1990, they said, look across the border here. Here are our comrades involved in negotiations with the regime to end this apartheid system. If we start a land reform process here in Zimbabwe now, it will frighten those whites. It will make it more complicated for our comrades there to negotiate with them. Let's wait. And they waited. With terms, in terms of implementing the reform, land reform program, it was entirely, entirely not to complicate our situation yet. The, the population in Zimbabwe were saying we, we fought, we engaged in struggle 
for land. So, in order to uh, agree to the transition, we agreed temporarily that, okay, we'll get it fixed like this, but now the cons that constitutional restriction is no longer there. And the Zimbabwe leadership said, yes, we know very well, we're part of that struggle, but it's important that our South African colleagues down there, they should succeed. So I'm saying, colleagues, the people, maybe many, many, many of us here would not understand this. The sense of engagement of ordinary Africans with this struggle here. You know, the Nigerian government says, government is not, doesn't have enough money, but people, you, the public, please contribute. And people contributed money, so they set up a big fund to finance this liberation struggle. South Africa must be free, therefore let's do whatever we can uh, to contribute to that. So over the years, there's a very close attachment that the rest of the continent has had with South Africa. And one of the reasons for that close attachment was that, you know, given the levels of uh, development of South Africa, uh, the, the struggle in which we are engaged will get rid of this white domination. Uh, and then you'll have a truly liberated South Africa, which will become part of the organization of African unity. And it's then, it's only then, that we'll be able really to launch our offensive intro to ensure the development of the continent because it brings these resources because of its level of, of development. I mean, that thing is in, in the knowledge of Africans that, throughout all this period. So it's very, very natural when South Africa is free for these Africans to say, let me go and have a look. You can't stop it. You can't say, disengage from your concept about South Africa and forget about your history of connection in terms of the struggle, you are not wanted. I'm saying the practical reality is that, and indeed this country has been more developed than others, it will attract people. There will be migration. We, the ANC, uh, has been a Pan-Africanist organization from its birth. So the questions that are raised, for instance, about SADC, integration within the SADC region, this has been part of the concept of the African National Congress forever. Integration on the African continent. Uh, that's why I'm saying that we've supported very much our government correctly, this continental free trade area. Yeah. Now, we, we've got to communicate our messages correctly. I agree with the point, the point that was made. The countries in this region, South Africa, Namibia, Botswana, Lesotho, and so on, the point that was made. Not that uh, they should exist to exist as independent countries, but this matter about integration. Uh, the possibility to develop the economies together. Uh, at one point, we, uh, in the government, decided that there must be some way by which we help the, when the tourists, the tourists come to South Africa, help to get them to go over the Dragonsberg Mountain into Lesotho. So we we'll try and build roads and, and do whatever. Because this idea of integration among ourselves, it's a strong idea, we have to act on it. But I'm saying there is a, the, the obvious thing that will happen, it will continue to happen, eh, of other Africans coming to this country. Now, I don't believe that we can have, now I'm talking from the point of view of the ANC, you can't have an immigration policy which is just defined by chase away the foreign nationals. You can't. <laughs> yeah. 
It needs proper management. It has legislation. It needs an agreement across the continent. If, if the South Africans feel that there are too many Nigerians coming, then let's engage the Nigerian government to say, let's manage this thing together. Because if, if we communicate one message to the rest of the continent, that the major objective of South African immigration policy is to chase away foreign nationals. We can't, we can't have a policy like that. You know, even today, uh, before the continental free trade area, all these big supermarkets, shop right checkers or whatever the answers are, they are all over the continent. So we want the rest of the continent to say, okay, your main task is to chase away people you call foreign nationals. We are going to chase you away too. As the ANC, you can't lead a process like that. It's not right. Uh, you know, uh, 2010, 2011, 2012, there are about. There was quite a lot of this, the so-called xenophobic attacks in the Western Cape against Somalis. Uh, because these South Africans are xenophobic, away with the Somalis. There was nothing like that. It had to do with the relations among traders. As a result of which, for instance, there was an agreement signed uh, with traders from Uguletu, this local South African, and the Somali traders. And in the agreement says things like, with regard to these main products, like bread, like milli meal, we must all of us charge the same price. There must not be price competition among ourselves. Uh, in this area, there should be no more, of, if we have a, a, a hundred uh, spaza shops, no more than 30 should be owned by the Somalis. It was a negotiated agreement signed by the traders, uh, and that is the end of the violence against the Somalis. I'm, I'm, I, keep, I keep insisting to this day, and people say that I'm crazy or denialist or something, that the black population of South Africa is not xenophobic. You don't get ordinary people in Alexander Township who wake up in the morning and decide, we don't like the Zimbabweans, let's get them. It doesn't happen. Or oh, Nigerians or something. Somebody else organizes that. <clears throat> Somebody organizes it and says, uh, like the Cape, the Cape Town, the Western Cape instance I'm talking about. When these traders launch everybody, we, don't, we hate the Somalis, let them go home. They are taking our jobs and so on. It's traders who are being outcompeted by the Somali traders. And when the matter is addressed and resolved, suddenly, for years and years, you've never had any xenophobic attacks against the Somalis in the Western Cape. So I'm saying, colleague, the colleague who raised the matter about migration, I think we as South Africans need to sort our thinking about this thing correctly. We see ourselves, uh, certainly from the ANC side, as an important engine for the transformation of the continent for the better. And indeed, the rest of the continent, when it engaged us in, in the struggle against apartheid, the hope was exactly that, that a liberated South Africa would be in the front ranks in terms of the transformation of the continent for the better. You can't play that role and be respected by the whole continent that at last in South Africa is doing something good for the continent. When you define yourself as somebody whose main task 
is to chase away foreign nationals. It's contradictory. It's a challenge you've got to deal with because people will come. Yeah. If, if somebody, if the government here had decided to do what uh, President Trump tried in the United States, to build a wall and electrify fences to, in order to keep a fortress South Africa, it wouldn't work. The people would still come. And I would never want to see a South Africa which settles itself with electrical fences. There was a leader, one of the leaders in the, in the suit, a political leader. He says to me one day that uh, his mother he says to him, uh, can you please give me 40 rand? Uh, sure. So I give my mother 40 rand. And she says to me, no, I, I need it because I'm going to Bloemfontein. They are in Marcelo. Uh, what are you doing in Bloemfontein? No, no, I'm going for a medical checkup. No, but if you're going for a medical checkup, they are going to charge you more than for the rent. And she says, no, no, no. I don't need it for the hospital. Is this boys at the border gate? Immigration. Sometimes they're silly. They delay you, so you pass them 10 rand or something. That's all I need the money for. And then when you get to Bloemfontein, the hospital, she's got a South African ID number, card. She says, no, this is why I produced probably, probably this and that's why. And he said to me, you know, I didn't know my mother with the South African ID card. She had. Uh, the reality, part of the reality here is that you have many people who cross from Eswatini to South Africa to collect grants. It's the same for Lesotho. Now, do you want to put an electrical fence there to stop those people coming? Yeah. These are other foreign nationals who are coming to take your grants. South Africa has got to be bigger than that. Yeah. <laughs> And certainly the matter about integration uh, is critical to the issue that we're talking about of the transformation of the African continent. Integration, for instance, of our region here in terms of trade and, and, and all of these things. We have a, a, a SADC agreement. A SADC agreement which provides for free movement of people. As part of that, process of in integration, free movement of people. African continent has got a similar protocol, which addresses the same thing, the free movement of people. Does South Africa say, okay, you move freely among yourselves except here? Yeah. Then South Africa ceases to be part of the African continent which I don't think should happen. There was a question raised about HIV. Uh, I wish uh, the colleagues can give their details, because I'd like to, we spend too much time discussing it. I'd like us to discuss that. Because the questions I raised then, I'm still raising them today. today. Uh, You see, for instance, I say, uh, AIDS, the acronym. The acronym is Afri uh, immu uh, Acquired Immune <laughs> Acquired Immune Deficiency Syndrome. It's not a disease. It's not AIDD. Acquired Immune Deficiency syndrome. Now a syndrome in medical terms is a group of diseases. 
the syndrome. So all of these diseases which fall within this syndrome, meningitis, HTB, uh, in the syndrome. Now when people then say to me, uh, HIV causes AIDS, I say one virus causes a syndrome. It diseases, a whole syndrome of diseases with known causes. Causes of which tuberculosis are known and it's curable. But it's part of the syndrome. So you can't say one virus causes all of these illnesses. What you can say is that this virus impacts negatively on the immune system. It ne impacts negatively on the immune system it's that weakened immune system which results in the syndrome. But there's a consequence to that kind of thinking, which is, therefore, when you go to test and that test says HIV positive, the uh, material, the fly sheets that would be in that container with the testing, will say, the fact that this thing might say you are HIV positive, it does not necessarily mean you got the virus. What it means is that the immune system is responding to something that is threatening the body. And therefore you need a clinical analysis in order to, tell, to determine what is this thing that the immune system is rejecting. It's, it's in standard, it's in all the medical documents that go with it. And it's correct. Because then you've got to go into this clin clinical examination in order to, t to determine which of these illnesses in the syndrome is the one that's affecting this person. And then you treat the person for that particular disease. I'm giving that as an example that the questions I asked and I still ask them today. If you say there's a virus which causes a disease, I understand that. But they're not saying that. There's a virus which causes a syndrome. I'm not a medical doctor. But the logic of it to me that sounds funny. Yeah. Unless you say yeah, there's a virus, HIV virus, which has, it impacts negatively on the immune system. When it talks about immune deficiency, it produces immune deficiency, among other things, which results in the body then becoming open to this syndrome of diseases. And bear in mind that medical science itself has got many other causes of immune deficiency. Malnutrition causes, sustained malnutrition causes immune deficiency. And so you can have immune deficiency which results in a syndrome with no HIV involved. Syphilis, unproperly treated syphilis, its symptoms go down when in fact the thing is still there. It will produce immune deficiency. I mean that's the science, it's the medical science. Yeah. So I'm saying when I ask the questions then, which I continue to ask, how do you explain all of this? Yeah. So we try to do our best to, I'm back at what I was saying earlier. You know, when, when people say, those of us who are old enough will remember this, uh, in the 90s, that, uh, you know, this HIV and AIDS, 
has hit South Africa. It's going to decimate the population. Real killer. So we are all in government and so we discuss this thing and say, but this is what we are told. There is this disease, it's called, which is really going to decimate the population. And therefore we have to respond to it in an effective manner. What is that response? So my view is that colleagues and comrades, let us study this phenomenon so that we understand it properly, so that we respond properly. And indeed, without medical, being a medical scientist, you read and read and read, read lots and lots of stuff. And that's where you get these questions raised by medical people. Yeah. This thing that you call a disease is not a disease. It's a syndrome of diseases. Yeah. Uh, okay. In which case, what's my, what's my response? Yeah. You can't say it be solved by an aspirin. No. The various interventions you need, which is why the question was raised uh, by the then Minister of Health in a very dramatic fashion. Nutrition. Nutrition is very, very critical to solving this problem. And that's why she was saying, therefore, you must take garlic and beetroot and so on. She was not saying uh, those things, but then you're going to be chopped. She was raising the matter about the importance of nutrition. And those particular types of foods, even today, have been raised in the context of this COVID-19. The same, same thing. <laughs> but there's somebody who's making a lot of money out of this particular story. And so you st stand up and say something which is threatening the prophets, then you are in real, real trouble. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Colleagues, you're going to play lottery, eh? not proper lottery, because we have run out of time. Then um, the president has been very, very detailed in his response. I'm going to take three quick questions in this block. Uh, one, two. Have, well, the two of you are, are in the same room. Two of you, and there's a hand that, yes, you gentlemen, and I'm going to take four hands this side. Four hands this side. The, the VC is doing something interesting. Uh, so I'm going to do this side. There's a gentleman in front here, not the journalists here. The, behind, I uh, want the lady, yourself, ma'am, in the gray. And I'm going to take the gentleman behind you. And I want one last female, and I'm going to take you in the floral. Um, those will be the four. Um, in that order. Three this side, four this side. Uh, uh, sorry, colleagues, let's start here. Yes, please go ahead. You guys will negotiate with the two. Please go ahead. You, you can go, shoot, say so you have a mic. Uh, colleagues, the microphone seems to be switched off. Matuma, maybe in the meantime, give the young lady a, that microphone um, to, to ask her question. Good evening, Mr. President. Um, Africa is very rich in terms of people who have diseases. So what I wanted to find out, in your view, is it possible ever that Africa at one stage will own its resources, just like open countries, so that we are able also to, we are able to put our, price, our own prices in the Thank you. Uh, greetings to the platform. Uh, my name is Given Mabasa. Uh, my question really it relates to you know, the event following or preceding the death or burial of Her Majesty the Queen. We've heard a lot of comments.